All right, welcome back everybody. Well, today I'm gonna put together an update on a project I've been working on most of the winter, on and off. This is not your normal dehumidifier. A little background is I purchased this dehumidifier about three, four years ago. And after about three years, one spring I started it up and it had no gas which was rather disappointing to say the least for a three-year-old dehumidifier because back in the day we are all familiar with dehumidifiers that have lasted 10, 20, 30 years or more. Needless to say they don't make stuff like they used to. So um, I wanted to find out where this dehumidifier leaked all its gas. So I spent the better part of a month taking it apart trying to determine where the leak actually was and never found it. Um, even to the point of taking the condenser and evaporator assembly uh, and having them pressurized with helium to 350, 400 PSI and never found the leak. So it had to have been in a connecting line between the compressor or uh, the condenser and evaporator, some minor porosity in the copper, who knows, but never found it. So. I decided, well, let's see what we can do with this thing. Since the evaporator and condenser was good, um, I wasn't about to buy a jug of 410A to try to put the thing back together as it was and use the original compressor. So I was lucky and was able to obtain a compressor that had been damaged in shipping. The stub tubes were bent, uh, cover was broken, but everything else was in great shape and I was able to straighten out the stub tubes. So. This is what we ended up with. And I decided, well, let's play around with this thing and see what it'll do. Um, a little background, further background, that is. Here's the original compressor that was in there. A little rotary. And kind of size comparison there. It's kind of hard to see, but it's quite a bit smaller and definitely a lot thinner being a rotary compressor. I was actually able to find that model number on a website of, I think the manufacturer's website possibly, and determine the size of that compressor and displacement. And that gives you at least an idea of what you need to look for on a replacement compressor if you plan to use an alternate refrigerant. Refrigerant is more about pressure than anything else as far as the operating pressure and that relates directly to the capacity of the compressor per revolution of displacement. So the stock compressor was just under 5 cc's per revolution and this one here is approximately twice that, about 10 cc's per revolution. Um, it's a half force compressor so it's 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 significantly larger. The, the 410A compressor was rated for 4,000 BTUs and this one here, depending on the refrigerant used, would be approximately 6,000 BTUs, a half horse compressor. So it was going to be a challenge to get this compressor to work efficiently with some extremely small coils. Um, on this condenser coil here, I mean, there's my finger and that's how big the coil diameter is. It's maybe 3 16ths of an inch maybe a little larger. It's some really small coils and then I think these are 5 16 uh, coils here. It's some metric tubing. Um, quite a few passes of coil but not a lot of diameter so that's something else we're uh, up against because of 410A operating at very high pressures uses very small coils and it gains a lot of efficiency that way. So the first thought was we're going to use R290 because obviously it's available in the refrigeration section at your local camping department. So uh, the first experiments revolved around um, using 290. Uh, we did have to change uh, the cap tube from the 410A unit. Um, this has gone through several iterations uh, of size and length. And we have our dryer down there and then it kind of winds around back up. We have the start relay, and that's the fan capacitor there, the little box. 
Uh, the start relay was not used with the original unit. Uh, and then we have a run cap and a start cap. Uh, this compressor will not start under any circumstances without some sort of a start cap. It doesn't need much, but it needs something. Um, it will not, I thought it might with, uh, on a system that equalizes pressure with a cap tube, it still would not start. So it needs a, a bit of a start cap and a start relay. Uh, the rest of the wiring is experimental to say the least. Um, you know, it's not something you want to go poking your fingers around. But um, back to the, the experiments, we ran some 290 experiments and it kind of confirmed my assumptions that um, there's just not enough coil area for this to operate correctly with uh, the displacement of this compressor and the pressures of the R290. Um, it was very, very difficult to get the, the suction pressure high enough to avoid it uh, freezing the coil. And then um, if you got the pressures up high enough so it wouldn't freeze, then it started flooding back. Um, it just didn't have enough uh, evaporation surface area, uh, unless it was very, very warm or, or rather humid, which um, in my basement for where I'm going to use this, it's, it's not warm enough and it's really not humid enough most of the time to put enough load on the evaporator. So we discarded that idea and then for just a whim, we figured let's just try some R152A and kind of that's where we're at now. I've done a little bit of tinkering, um, but I wanted to get a, a run through it and then flush the system out with a, that charge and then just refill it again after a good vacuum. So. Um, I've had it running on the vacuum using my 30 year old new old stock uh, JB vacuum pump that I picked up off of I think Marketplace last year and then uh, so we're sitting down on 30 inches been there for a while so we know it doesn't have any leaks in it and then uh, we're gonna give it some 152A and get the charge optimized for uh, the kind of the cool of the basement down here since all of the Guts have been removed, all the electronic brain. Obviously the control panel is no longer functional. So what I did is added on a external box here with a, just sort of see the kind of the membrane there poking through the, the window holes. It's a humidistat from a old attic fan controller that I swapped out. Um, it was a temperature and humidity based uh, fan controller which didn't work correctly so I replaced it with just a temperature only attic fan controller and found that the humidistat portion was still good. At the time I didn't have really a need for it but I kept it anyway and lo and behold it uh, came in handy. It's exactly the same sort of um, humidistat you'd find in an old vintage mechanical dehumidifier so um, just mounted it in a handy box, ran a cord grip and then that just runs down to the terminal strip to turn on and off uh, power for the entire unit. It's amazing how well stocked the uh, refrigerant aisles are at your average uh, department store. It's amazing what you can find. So this is canned air as we all know it, which everybody else like us knows it as R152A, which is a very much similar to R12 uh, refrigerant. It's almost identical in temperatures and pressures and actually is probably a little bit better in performance. So got a Partial can here. Like I said use some of it from the original testing. So put some warm water there when we need it. We're still sitting at vacuum. We've got both uh, high side and uh, low side connected. We'll purge our purge our lines, and then we'll start giving her a little juice. One thing you want to make sure you never ever ever do is start a compressor in vacuum. Um, they usually do not tolerate it very well, especially higher voltage compressors like your larger uh, three phase units or even single phase 240. Um, you start those in a vacuum, usually it's death to them. They'll arc over and, and fail. So we'll get a little water going here. Well. You can hear it boiling in there.
See our low side coming up. We'll give it a little bit more and then we'll fire up and see what happens. Got uh, not quite 50 on the low side, so we'll go ahead and power it up. You hear the start relay click and it rapidly pulling her down to zero so we know we need to get a little more juice in there. Starting to frost from the inlet right there. The target for 152A is about 25 PSI on the low side is freezing when uh, it boils, so you need to get above 25, otherwise you're going to ice it up. And our low side is about uh, 60. Sorry, frost. Get a little more juice here. Have to get another can warm here. This compressor is extremely quiet. I mean, it's running, but you can't hear it. It, it doesn't have that Tecumseh hum, reset hum when it starts. It's it's a very very quiet unit. It's actually a dual branded unit. It's a Emerson Copeland unit. But then if you peel their label off the side that says filled with POE 12 ounces, you find out it's a Embraco from Slovakia, OEM to Emerson. It's a little, little low here yet. Give it some more juice. My, my choice in container here is rather poor as far as fit goes. It may be empty. got here. Yeah, it feels like an empty one. Alright, stay tuned. We're going to swap cans and we'll come back. Alright, I've got a fresh can hooked up and our line's purged out. We're going to add a little more gas. You always want to give it a little time to stabilize out between adding adding more refrigerant. Um, otherwise, it's real easy to overcharge. By the time you if you stop feeding it when it hits your target, it's usually going to end up being more than it needs when it's, it uh, stabilizes. Right now, because we're short, we've only got just a, a partial that's actually really the pole. You can see the frost on the actual coil is just starting to melt now. It's got no more refrigerant in there. But we're still definitely on the low side. Something else you have to be careful since I've got a high side hose hooked up. Uh, the high side hose does have a check valve on the end of it. That's the larger type uh, connector there. Basically, this a high side line will be completely full of refrigerant. And you either want to pull that into the low side, you disconnect the line, and then you open up the, uh, 
the high and the low side valves with the center port plugged and it'll pull the high side liquid from the line into the low side instead of just wasting it but you uh, need to accommodate that when you charge the system because you're going to get uh, you know, maybe another half ounce of, of liquid in the system from there that's trapped in the hose. Systems that they use for charging um, the uh, R600, the isobutane, and even R290 system because of the small refrigerant charges, the hoses are a very, very small diameter hose and uh, kind of everything's almost miniature to minimize the trapped uh, liquid. So we're starting to freeze a little further up now, but we're still definitely below our, our freezing point of water as far as the pressure goes. You'll notice the high side pressure is about 90 PSI and that um, it's actually very low but the reason is because your condenser is taking probably 40 degree air from the evaporator so you're condensing at a very very low temperature provided you're not overloading the condenser. I had that issue with the R290. Uh, the liquid temperature was about 70 degrees coming into the dryer on the liquid line, but the uh, condensing temperature was about 110 degrees. So I had an enormous amount of subcooling uh, because the to get the, the low side pressure up, I basically had to overload the system, which then filled up the condenser somewhat with uh, liquid refrigerant and caused the high side to get quite a bit higher. It's just a, it's just a very poor balanced system because of the um, essentially having a compressor that's just far too large for the evaporating condensing area. So now we're coming up on just a little over 20 on the low side. So a little more. I kind of got to sneak up on it. So we're hitting 24 pounds, which is just about where the freezing point is. And you can see we're just starting to melt there at the cap tube. So now that's our evaporating pressure, is right at the freezing point, 32 degrees. And what we want to do is continue to charge until each coil is, is wet with condensation. And then we want to charge until the liquid, or the return line rather, the suction line, isn't excessively cold and sweating. We want to get just to the point where it's just a little bit warmer. And then especially when uh, you get all that flood back, flood back into the compressor, You'll actually start seeing like a condensation mark as the liquid's running into the, uh, the dome here. And in an excessive floodback situation, the oil and, and refrigerant will actually develop a line of condensation or even frost in a really bad case on the, the sump of the compressor if you're flooding back an excessive amount. And uh, needless to say, that's not really, really good for compressor longevity. So we're getting real close to our point here where we want to start being a little more careful with what we add. Again, there's our discharge liquid line pressure, about 90 pounds, um, and that's about where it's going to stay once we sneak up on the charge. So I'm going to pause here for a minute and disconnect that high pressure line and then uh, run that liquid back into the low side carefully and then we'll stabilize it out just using the low side pressure so hang on for a second all right so i've got the little line capped off it's not a two-handed affair that's why i paused it for a minute so we've got the fitting off which is sealed now because this is a, a check valve fitting and we got a basically a line here full of liquid you can see we're still hanging on the high side pressure so i'm going to open the high side valve, which is going to dump 
basically whatever's liquid in that wine, um, it'll share it with whatever's going to the can, and then it'll also show up on the low side once we give it a little more juice here. And it goes pretty fast. Now we're about 26. A little bit of cold coming back on the suction line. All the frost is melting. Not quite condensing all the way to the top. It's, it's getting cold. We'll let this run for a little bit and see where she stabilizes at. Shot more, it's not quite cold all the way to the top. I'm gonna let this run for a second, we'll be right back. All right, it's been running for about five minutes. We're stabilized at about 30, no, excuse me, 2070. Pounds on the low side, and uh, 27 pounds for R152 equates to 37 degrees. So we come up here, we got the glare. Okay, hit the, we got the glare and hit the. Try to do this looking two different places. I don't know. There we go. So the entry out of the cap tube right into the condenser, or evaporator, rather, is running, just trying to hit the right spot, 37 degrees. I'm going to get on it. So the rest of the, as you go up, it's about a 40 degree coil. I'd like it a little lower, but that's where it seems to run happy, but it's even all the way up now. Until you get right to the top. Oh, there's 39 right there, 40. But you see now we're starting to get just a little bit of sweat back on the suction line. But once you get all the way down, the compressor here for just a little bit and as it goes in it's basically dry so we're getting just a little bit of superheat out of the condenser and it's 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 cold cool but it's not ice cold you know they say it's not you know beer can cold well uh, it's pretty accurate but what you want to avoid is having actually liquid coming back in and then making your compressor cold which it's not, it's good shape. The dome's warm, it's got a little bit of heat in it. But we're frosted all the way up, we're condensed all the way up. We got a shot of moisture collecting. And our discharge air over here. About 80 degrees. It's just slightly warm. Basement temperature is about 62 degrees. So that's why I say you gotta watch out for a you know, cool basement, cool ambient temperatures. It's hard to get a, a, you know, enough capacity in your evaporator to boil without freezing up. Off. Here's the refrigerant boiling. Now the nice thing about a high start torque compressor 
can shut off and on as much as you want. With the start cap and the, and the start relay, you don't have to wait for the system to equalize. And then last but not least, here's what she's pulling for current draw. 3.6 amps. About 390 watts. The original unit was rated at 4 amps and probably about 450 watts, give or take. Um, so it's, it's drawing less current and power than it did originally. Uh, when I was running this on the uh, R290, it was running about 560 watts, uh, right around 5 amps. So the, the higher pressure of the propane R290 refrigerant uh, puts a greater load on the compressor. The compressor is rated for 7.5 amps. So um, you don't normally run them at full rated amps, but you know 6 amps would be no stretch at all for it. So even with the R290 at 5, 5.3 amps, uh, it was having a pretty easy job of it. And now running the low pressure of the uh, R152, um, it's, it's practically idling. It's really underloaded. All right, I better drain out the water before it gets too full. I just have this, I stole this plug off of the other dehumidifier for now. So I usually use the hose on the other one. But I don't want to run it too long with the others. I'll fill up here. So that's been running about 15 minutes, 20 minutes since uh, we decided the charge was pretty much final. Some might have actually run into the, the bucket. If you keep this cap long enough, it fills up and it runs into the, uh, the collection bucket on the front. But that's a good cup of water in 20 minutes or so, maybe 30 minutes tops. This has been testing it, so pretty good. Regarding the other details of construction, I have this, uh, the chassis of the unit just screwed down to this board through the three original compressor mounting holes. So it's, it's fixed to the the board and then the original wheels we just took off the uh, out of the plastic and then just drill a hole through the board and push the caster stem for so it is uh, just mobile like it used to be and then a little bit of sweating back now but it just starts to stop as it goes into the compressor so I've probably got a little bit too much charge in it but for now, I think I'll leave it. And uh, like I said, it's still not real, real warm or real humid down here. So I'll we'll leave it at that for now and we'll kind of see how the old Frankenstein runs for a little while. Thanks for watching.